story. Welcome back to this specially extended edition of The World This Week with me, Phil Rees. Well, Israel has threatened to invade the Palestinian territory in response to the killing of three of its citizens in the southern town of Kiryat Malaki, when a rocket fired from Gaza struck an apartment block. The Israeli military, meanwhile, continued with a second day of intense air raids and naval attacks on Gaza. Thirteen Palestinians, including four civilians, have died since the fighting began after Israel assassinated Ahmed Jabari, the boss of Hamas's military wing, the Al-Qassam Brigades. Well, it's the heaviest fighting between Israel and Hamas since Israel launched a full-scale invasion four years ago, also in response to rocket fire. Well, it's showing no signs of letting up. But one thing has changed over the past four years. The Muslim Brotherhood is now in power in Cairo. Of course, Hamas roots lie with the Muslim Brotherhood. So how will Egypt react? Before we discuss that, here's Fabia Martin. Israeli army video shows the moment before its Hamas military commander Ahmed al-Jabari yesterday afternoon. When the missile impacted with the car in which he was travelling, Hamas said that al-Jabari, who ran the organisation's armed wing, died. On the ground, the destruction caused crowds to gather as emergency services rushed to the scene. The escalating violence comes in the wake of a series of exchanges of fire in the last few days between Israel and militants in the Gaza Strip. But then Israel launched Operation Pillar of Cloud by killing the military commander and threatened an invasion of the enclave that the Islamist group vowed would open the gates of hell. Hamas official Khaled al Haya spoke out last night to say, أحمد الجعربي لطالما عمل وانتظر هذا اليوم بنى وأسس وقاد وانتصر في كل المواقع وهو اليوم ينتصر في موقع الشهادة وعدونا الصهيون إن شاء الله تعالى يدفع ثمن هذا الاغتيال الجبان لأحد أبرز قيادة حماس وقيادة القسم Within minutes of Al Jabari's death, huge explosions were rocking Gaza City as Israel's airstrikes hit selected targets just before sundown. Huge plumes of smoke rose from the buildings of the city and spread into the sky as the sun set. And earlier today, an Israeli army spokeswoman, Lieutenant Colonel Avita Leibovich, told Reuters... All the options are on the table, including the possibility of a ground operation. We have alerted some of our reserve units and uh, we are considering uh, our next steps. Currently, we are striking uh, various targets from the air targets of either uh, caches of rockets, storages of rockets, underground tunnels used to store rockets, and other targets. However, many other targets in this exchange of fire have been civilians. Women and children on both sides have been killed and injured, and in the Gaza city the numbers of civilian casualties are quickly rising. The greatest concern for many is the apparent lack of differentiation between civilians and factions by the Israeli military. Funeral processions are already taking place in Gaza City, where large crowds are gathering, vowing revenge attacks on Israel. Emergency status was launched within an hour of Operation Pillar of Cloud in Gaza City, and with air, naval and now ground strikes underway, is this the start of another full-scale war akin to that of 2008-2009? Across America, Canada, Australia, the Middle East and Europe, people began to organise protests against these attacks on Gaza. This afternoon, people in London will be gathering outside the Israeli embassy to do just that. Fabian Martin with that report. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio by Dr. Mohammed Ghanem, the UK representative of the Muslim Brotherhood. We also have the former chair of Peace Now UK group, Paul Uzuskin. And we're also very pleased to welcome back again from last week, Martin Linton, the founder and former chair of Labour Friends of Palestine. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, obviously, it's a very serious situation um, there in Palestine and uh, Israel. Um, you know, Dr. Ghanem, um, you represent the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Hosni Mubarak, when he was in power, um, you know, was well known, as we, as I mentioned earlier, for hugging Israeli leaders and Sharm el Sheikh. Um, things are different now, but what are you actually going to do about it? Well, the relation completely changed now, and we, Dr. Morsi, as a leader of all the Egyptian, he has to reflect the, the will of the Egyptian people. And the Egyptian people would never like uh, this policy. Uh, Israeli government have this uh, continuous policy 
is to uh, to see not respecting the Palestinian blood, not respecting the human element in that. And uh, as a state, when you see this picture, uh, like uh, intended policy to kill. When the state gather or gather on uh, personal and individual and have casualty of eight or seven civilians, that's not acceptable so, worldwide. Let I me mean, ask you the question again then. So what are you going to do about it? Yeah, we... I can't decide at the moment, but we don't like it. The policy, the old policy cannot uh, repeat it. We're not going to continue what Mubarak has done. What Morsi done today, or yesterday, or a couple of days ago, he took, uh, withdraw his ambassador. They asked the ambassador to leave, and the relation would be aggravated. And this relation aggravated is not good for anybody. It makes the political situation uh, unsettled, and that neither benefit the Israeli government or the Israel uh, people know the Egyptian. How mm. excited this uh, aggression going to result, uh, nobody can uh, predict it. Mm. But the thing is, uh, the Israel government is always looking for an event to aggravate more and aggravate more. No, but I mean, Israel has uh, traditionally felt that it can do what it wants in the Middle East, um, in effect, and there's been no serious comeback from anybody when it's done these things. So, um, you know, let me ask you just to, once again, what will you do? What do you think should be done then? I mean, will there be perhaps an Egyptian attack on Gaza? Would it, I say attack, would they come in to rescue the people of Gaza in that sense? Well, at the moment, nobody's looking for war between Israel and Egypt. Well, there's a war but, going uh, on, though, between the Palestinians and, and Israel. Well, we can't say it's war at the moment because we have uh, to negotiate with the Hamas, which has taken the charge in uh, Gaza, and uh, we will have to coordinate more with them and see what is the mm. negotiation will come up with. But nobody will just remain silent. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, Paul Zeskin, I mean, you know, hasn't Israel learnt a lesson of the Arab Spring, really, that perhaps the hegemony that it enjoyed with the backing of dictators is no longer there, and it is actually now uh, walking on a tightrope that could lead to a real disaster, especially if it was, for example, to have a ground invasion of Gaza. Yes, I don't think that that's uh, um, a good assessment of Israel in the current circumstances at all. I don't think the current government of Israel sees that it needs to be accountable in any context. It has Egypt, and the only thing that Egypt really uh, provides to Israel is the maintenance of its peace deal and some form of security inside Sinai. It has Syria totally involved in its own internal problems. Israel is in many, many respects locally kind of immune from what, so from what's going on. So you don't actually think the Muslim Brotherhood government will do anything? I mean, I, as an I Israeli, can't. you don't think the government thinks that they're actually there. They may talk the about it, but nothing's going to happen. The only thing that I see, and I heard this before we came on air, is that apparently the Egyptian prime minister is going to go and visit Gaza tomorrow. That's a statement of some form of courage by the Egyptians that says, OK, try shooting at us when we're there, see what happens. Mm. And I would imagine that the Israelis will, will, will not uh, continue their, their operations whilst such a senior person from the Egyptian government is in Gaza. Mm. Interesting. Um, Martin uh, Linton, I mean, how, how do you see this unfolding? Because, of course, all the, the past incursions, or at least, you know, invasions, however you want to describe it, um, have kind of had a pattern, haven't they, whereby the Israelis have gone in, there's been global criticism, but nothing was done and the Palestinians have suffered. So do you see a different dynamic here? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously tragic that three Israelis have lost their lives, but it's a terrible uh, indictment of our uh, the fact that we don't care about Palestinians. I mean, 84 Palestinians have died so far this year in Gaza from Israeli fire. How much has been in the news about that? It's only when three Israelis die that people suddenly sit up and wake up. But And, and this, the, these double standards infect the whole of our media as well. I mean, clearly, Israelis regard Palestinian life as expendable, but we've got to the stage now in, in this country where we don't report Palestinian deaths because they're not considered significant. And uh, you know, the whole 
whole the, this whole attitude is running through, uh, running through. I mean, I, I don't think people are thinking it consciously. But for instance, the um, for every single Israeli who has been injured by Palestinian fire so far this year. 43 Palestinians have been injured by Israeli fire. I mean, that's a fantastic disproportionality. And, and we, we're hardly aware of it. If you read the papers, you wouldn't mm. have the remotest idea that 43 Palestinians had been injured for each, for each Israeli that was affected. Uh, and and um, what we have to do is to look at this uh, whole issue from the and Palestinian standpoint been, too. There's always been a, a vast disproportion in terms of the number of deaths, as you say, to read 40 to 1, certainly 5 or 10 to 1, any of those. In, yeah. in the Gaza war, it was 100 to 1. But, but it was kind of accepted, though, uh, that, you know, the reasons, if you probably watch the BBC News tonight, British News, they'll talk about the three Israeli deaths, because Israel is saying it's going to do something about it. Whereas when many Palestinians mm -hmm. die, Arab leaders have done nothing in the past. Isn't that part of the problem? As well as, of course, the journalists believing that there are two equal sides here. But, you know, there is that other issue, that nothing has happened well, when the Palestinians are killed. We have to bear in mind that Israel is now, I mean, uh, 50 years ago, Israel was a small country surrounded by hostile, uh, hostile other countries with a certain amount of military power. But now Israel is the fourth strongest military power in the world. It has F-16s, it has drones, it has fantastic, uh, you know, um, sophisticated military equipment. No power in the Middle East, possible exception of Saudi Arabia, could even could contemplate uh, taking, challenging the Israeli uh, armed forces because they are so far superior. The Palestinians have no army at all. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, in the West Bank there is no army, there's just a security force, and in, in Gaza there's just basically well, a police force. They pick up so a gun, of it, course, they're called terrorists, aren't they? So. I think if one's going to criticise the Gazans, it, it's because they, uh, you know, they, they are crazy to, uh, to to start threatening the Israelis because they're going to be hit even harder. We know that well, we know what's going to happen. I mean, is that a problem? I mean, we're just looking at a report that just came in just before I was on air here, talking about a build-up of armed forces, Egyptian armed forces, here in the Sinai Peninsula along the border between um, Israel and Egypt. Um, this was support, uh, cited by a local agency. Uh, I mean, isn't this the problem that we're coming to, in a way, is that Israel is powerful, it has, and we're going to be talking about this later in the program, 200 or so nuclear missiles. Um, I mean, isn't the problem that, you know, you can't do anything as a Muslim Brotherhood government? If you were to actually threaten to protect, as it were, the people of Gaza in any serious military way, that, you know, you'd lose out at the end of the day. Well, that could be a very good test to what the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt to, to push the government to do. It's a very good test, and I think that uh, question in every mind in the Israeli government. Let us see what the Egyptian going to do. But I don't think that will, will pass without any action. There will be some action. Uh, I'm not saying that as knowledge, but I'm as an analysis. There has to be some analysis for your this. Army, your army was prepared to do anything? I mean, well, I, I'm not saying you have contacts in the military and you've talked to them, but obviously I'm sure Prime Minister Morsi does. Well, this issue is very dangerous for anybody to comment as uh, uh, expecting or suggesting anything. This thing has to be wisely considered. And uh, in the back of the mind, as far as... Israel has no retaliation whatsoever, and they do whatever they like. They will keep doing what they do. do. We understand that. There must be an action. What it is, it's up to the people in the government in Egypt, it are up to the army in Egypt, it's up to the Ikhwan in general to see how the public opinion uh, would force them to do. But the result, the end result is nobody can accept that anymore and keep silent. Mm. Well, Paul Azuski, what do you think Israel would do? What do you think the Netanyahu, Netanyahu government would do um, if the Egyptian army, um, for example, entered Gaza, or uh, were asked to come in uh, by Hamas um, to help protect them? I think it would be rather a, a convenient way of seeking the de-escalation that I'm told by sources on both sides today that they really are looking for. They've done what they wanted to do with Jabari. They've expanded the operation to hit out at other missile sites. I think they're kind of waiting for an opportunity to come back. 
I think there's another, another element that we haven't really talked about as well, and that's the timing of this. This all comes at a time where the Prime Minister is facing re-election. Uh, I can understand why the Israeli military would want to take out a target like Jabari when it's presented to them, because he's somebody who was never really able to be hit so easily before. So um, but but actually, everything else around it strikes me as, as very, very crudely timed to boost election profiles. Sort of election gimmick. I mean, are you saying that a kind of a war and a extrajudicial killings is actually very popular with the Israeli electorate? Ninety percent of the Jewish population of Israel support what's happened in the last 24 hours. Mm, sad. Um, I mean, you know, given that, Martin, um, I mean... What do you see as the possibilities for the Muslim Brotherhood? How much leeway have they got to, 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 to move and, 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 and the Egyptians in terms of dealing with an Israeli electorate that thinks this way, an Israeli government and a Netanyahu who basically thinks he can do what he wants? Well, I, mean, I agree that, that it, you know, it's too much of a coincidence that uh, this uh, escalation should start now just two months before the Israeli election due on January the 22nd, because the the Operation Cars led uh, in, in December 2008. That happened exactly two months before an election, and clearly one of the motives for that uh, assault, um, almost unprovoked ass assault, was uh, in order to get support in the election. Now, I mean, it's unbelievably cynical, but th that, I'm afraid, is my conclusion that that, that, that is the moti one of the motivations. What the Egyptians can do about it, um, you know, I really, uh, I really don't think that uh, the Egyptians are in a, pa in a position or any, uh, any of the neighbouring Arab countries to take any military action. But certainly I think it's inevitable that, that they will have to, uh, at some stage, move away from the uh, peace agreement they have or uh, with Israel, especially in, in, in respect to the Rafah crossing, because it is intolerable, really, that a Muslim, uh, Muslim Brotherhood government should uh, keep such strict control over this crossing when there are, are shortages of food and shortages of building material uh, across the border in Gaza. And while they don't want to take responsibility for Gaza, they don't want to... Why aren't they doing more about that, though? I think a lot well, of people are asking that. This is a question I've, I've wanted to ask I've tried to ask the Egyptians uh, under Mubarak for a long time and never had a satisfactory reply. I'm assuming that uh, uh, in due course, the Morsi government in Egypt will take uh, a very different... Well, why don't we ask Mohammed Ghanim? He's here from the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, why, why have you been so slow in doing anything about the Rafid crossing and exactly the points that Martin Linton is talking about? Well, having uh, bringing the war again in the area is, is a huge issue. You can't just take it by decision. But uh, the, the event itself, even the analysis is say before the election, always Israeli does this action before and after election. Maybe the general accepting, the general public accept this sort of action, but it's nothing to do with election because it always happened. What the Egyptian government and what the Khwan does and what the military, it has to have a coordination between the the leadership, Mr. Morsi, and the army, and whatever political uh, so are, entities, are not saying, only Muslim are you Brotherhood, actually, which is the elected controlling the action of the government. So the elected government of Egypt, you're saying, actually doesn't have the power to do what it wants about the Rafa crossing. But there is no election government here. The government at the moment is not elected, and we it's still the have the vacuum of the constitution yeah. and the parliament, which makes the, the, the position of Egypt leadership is very difficult and as well as there is some other political uh, entities the political parties which is are waiting and to see then to get all these to agree in one action is very difficult mm. well I mean do you think that Israel um, Paul Ezeskin will ever, and I mean do you not see an inevitable confrontation in, in a sense that Martin Linton was saying that Camp David, the closure of Gaza, when the Muslim Brotherhood actually gains strength and gains, you know, whatever is needed in terms of the constitution in Egypt, that actually there's a ticking time bomb, I don't use that too literally, of course, that Israel cannot act in the way that it has been doing and it must change. There's a clock that's ticking. I think the clock's ticking extremely slowly. And whilst it does that, it plays to Israel's advantage. The current government of Israel seeking its own re-election doesn't see that there's anybody around to stop it.
However, I hear that whilst at the same time it kind of reneged on the, the makings of a deal brokered by Egypt for a ceasefire. At the same time as doing that, it also kind of sent a message to Egypt saying, and you won't break the peace deal with us, will you? And I don't think is, the current Israeli government can go on forever thinking it can have that cake and eat it too. But as Mr. Ghanem points out and describes to you, the Egyptian context plays into Israel's hands until there is clear direction from the top of the Egyptian government through the military to action, Israel will think that as far as Egypt is concerned, the deal will be it's maintained and it will be, yeah. it will be immune from Egyptian yeah. action. I mean, very quickly, um, Martin Linton, I mean, is that, you know, let's just talk about Egypt in that sense there. Do you feel that, you know, maybe Paul's, what he's saying is right there, that, you know, it really does need to get a clear message about his policy in the Middle East and at the moment nobody really knows. Well, well, I do agree. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that, that Morsi will come to a, a much clearer decision. But I, I think we should be looking much more to Washington and to Brussels for a solution to the Israel-Palestine problem uh, than to Cairo. Cairo has an important part to play, but it can't play, play it without... Uh, without the West, without the EU and the uh, and to some extent President Obama taking a clear li line, they've been very critical of Israel over the settlements, mm -hmm. over the blockade of Gaza, but they haven't taken any action. They need to take action. Martin Linton, thank you very much. Thank you to all our guests. I'm afraid we're going to wrap up this part. In the third section of this specially extended program, evidence that sanctions could cause large numbers of deaths in Iran due to a lack of medical supplies. But that isn't stopping the European Union escalating sanctions. So how many deaths are acceptable in order to prevent Iran developing a nuclear bomb, a bomb which it says is just a figment of Western imagination. More on this in a few minutes.